Fake feminist men, wolf in sheep's clothing. I just know it's gonna be good, girl. Do you wanna know my weirdest red flag? When a guy quickly self-identifies as a feminist. It sounds wrong to worry about that, right? I mean, they're saying all of the right things, so why am I so full of this feeling of mistrust? And why do so many of us actually feel the same way? We've seen publicly praised progressive guys in recent years be shown to have done really bad things, behaving in completely different ways behind closed doors to how they act and portray themselves in public. And it's this which is making them a wolf in sheep's clothing. And the issue is, it's not just them, it's the fact that they stay mates with people who continuously do terrible things. And uh, they seem to not have a problem with it because it doesn't directly affect them. I mean, they're a good guy, right? And let's be real, it's way easier to cast doubt on the victim themselves, especially if they're not a perfect victim, rather than actually have to question your mate. Ooh, interesting. The Amber Heard Johnny Depp case, you know, I was thinking about doing a special show where we review all of the public things again, because when it first happened, I didn't say anything about it because I was like, this seems weird. Then when it got... So Amber Heard had won her victory. So in the public, Amber Heard was the victim. Then when Johnny Depp was the victim, I felt similarly where he was more of the victim in a mutually toxic and abusive relationship because that was the information that I was given. But now people are saying it's obvious Amber Heard was the victim. And I'm like, oh, shit. Okay, hold on. So then I was like, maybe we should go back and review it with fresh eyes to see if maybe we were wrong. And was Amber Heard actually more of the victim in a mutually toxic relationship? Because I do think it's mutually toxic. Remember that Johnny Depp was in a long-term relationship with his then partner who he had two kids with, cheated with Amber Heard. And Amber Heard is like 20 years younger than him, right? So Amber Heard was willing to be the other woman, which puts her morals in question. She was willing to be with Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp was also infamously a person who in Hollywood people loved and saw toxicity in. And Amber Heard is somebody that people have liked but is new to the industry and people have had a lot of issues with. So to me, they're both mutually sounds like toxic, but it always made it sound like she sounded more toxic. But I remember when it first first came out and I called my bestie and I was like, oh, Johnny Depp's apparently. And we had loved Johnny. We had seen all his movies. So we automatically thought Amber was innocent. But then it sounded like Johnny was innocent. And then it sounded like they were both guilty. And now... Maybe we should go back and review the court case with fresh eyes because maybe we'd come to a different conclusion because now the girls are taking Amber's side again. And I'm like, oh, did something change? But I wonder if anything ever did change. Hmm? Interesting. On the victim themselves, especially if they're not a perfect victim, rather than actually have to question your mate and then possibly have to question yourself and be like, oh, have I done bad things? If this is counted as bad thing as what they've done, Mm. My patrons actually chose this topic, so your wish is my command, mm. my little forest critters. I've really recently launched my Patreon, so if you do want to check nice. it out, it's linked for you down below. And all of the different tiers are on the screen now. So you've got squirrels for $2 a month, you've got foxy friends for $5 a cute, month, cute, and you've cute. got my trash panda enablers for $10 a month. <gasps> Everything is linked for you down below. And Love if it. you can't afford it, seriously, there is no problem, no pressure at all, because you just being here, you watching my videos, liking, commenting, watching to the end, that stuff makes a giant difference to daddy YouTube. So Thank you very much for doing that. So, with true, huge difference. Absolutely. Without any further ado, let's get into the topic. Personally, I really like my monsters to be obvious. You know, the traditional Disney villain who like relishes in badness, the Bond villain who is stroking a fluffy cat, who is just <laughs> saying all of their evil plans, and they just can't even help themselves with just how evil they are. You know, think about the guy on the Tinder profile who's holding up a shirt at the gym, he's taking a picture. You know, you know exactly what they're about. You can easily avoid them. You spot them a mile away, you can cross the street, you can call your friends, you can warn each other. Even if you do have to come across them in your life, your guard is definitely up when you're dealing with them, right? It's the sneaky monsters that I'm most afraid of. Mm. They fit in amongst the sheep, they learn all of the right things to say, they learn. This is what we're always worried of. All of us are worried that we're going to misjudge somebody, right? Because look, as a woman, I don't want to misjudge a man just because he's a man and think he's abusive. But then it's like, how are we going to judge people? And I can't hold people to the standard I live my own life because my morals are for me. They're not for you. And most of you wouldn't qualify. No offense. But like, let's be real. A lot of these men out here would not qualify for my standard. Okay. So like, eh. but it's not even that high of a standard. <laughs> Don't even get me started with how low of a standard I feel like I have for people. And they're like, it's too high. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> oh my God. Anyways. So this is the fear we have. Is, are we misjudging somebody? Is somebody tricking us? But then you don't want to be paranoid and assume everyone is out here to get you because like 
Nobody wants to be Jordan Peterson, you know? Nobody wants to be JK Rowling. Nobody wants to be that paranoid. So it's like, how do you make sure you're not paranoid? I go by the data and I accept that humans are deeply flawed. They're deeply flawed. But this is why, and she said it earlier, what happens if you stay friends with a bad person? I don't mind being friends with a bad person as long as I can tell people you're bad. If you expect me to be your friend and tell people you're good because you're my friend, oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I love you. No, 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 no. I am. I have no problems being friendly with somebody who's in recovery, who's on a journey to be a better person because I don't think you're always a bad person. I think one day you might actually try to be a good person. And I would love to help, you know, cheer you on in the process. I mean, you got to do the work, but I got to be able to tell people like, oh, don't mess with them. They're on a journey. But if you expect me, if you're like, oh, but if you're my friend, you'll always root for me. I will always root for you to do better, better, but I will never lie to people about your bad behavior. Like I'm, yeah, Biza says, yeah, I'm not covering for anyone. I'm not covering for you. I'm not going to cover up for you. I'm not going to tell people you're good if you're not, but also I believe in your ability to be a better person. So I'm not going to end our friendship just because you're a bad person, but I might have some boundaries because again, I'm open, but with boundaries, I'm open, but with boundaries, as my shirt says, I'm open, but with boundaries exactly how to disarm you super quickly. I mean, they tick all of the boxes, right? They're progressive. They've possibly even turned it to a march. They maybe even posted- Also, I do think there's a difference between inner circle and outer circle for this reason. Visa says, if you cheat, I'm telling your partner loser. Look, if I just have a casual friend and they cheat on their partner, I'm going to end that friendship. But if you're like my sibling or if you're like an inner circle person and like you cheat on somebody, I'm going to encourage you to go to therapy and I'm not going to end our friendship. Because casual friends are who you end friendships with over petty disagreements. French, like other friends, you don't just end a friendship because somebody cheated on their partner, in my opinion, or robs a bank or commits a felon, like a felony. Like you don't ditch people because they make bad choices. You ditch people that aren't important to you because they made bad choices. If you're not important to me, I'm probably going to ditch you over like who you vote for. But if you're important to me, then I will, you know, I will hold you accountable, but I will also love you. It's called unconditional love, guys. It's called unconditional love. Okay. The black square in 2020, like every other performative person did. And most of all, they dunk on openly misogynistic men. Therefore. Oh my God. Beautiful. Boy says my friend once told me after I asked her why she's my friend, because at the time I was a bad person and she replied, because you're trying to be good and that counts for something and changed my life. That's beautiful, bro. Beautiful. They know who the bad people are, so that means that they're on your side, right? Yes, I'm talking about faux feminist men who fall under the same umbrella as brutalists. Quick disclaimer, because I have to say this every single time, this is not an attack on all men. This is on a very specific type of man mm -hmm. and the thing that some men are doing. Chances are that you're mostly a good person and none of this applies to you. We're on about something very specific and sneaky here, which is warranted due to things which have been happening, not only in the public mm -hmm. sphere, but also in people's private spheres. And I really want to be able to have this conversation with you. And I'm of the belief that people can be good people and also stuff up. Like, nobody is perfect. I've never said that. I've always said that humans are flawed. Like, you may accidentally overstep someone's boundary, but then you learn from it, you have a conversation, and you don't hold it against them. It's when people have a repeated pattern of behavior. That's the stuff that I worry about. Mm -hmm. That's the thing which I am highlighting here. Agree, agree. And even if you do identify with some of these things, that doesn't make you a terrible person, okay? The fact that you actually feel uncomfortable about something means that you're self-reflecting on that, which means that there is potential for learning. That's what I pay attention to. When people can't face themselves and they feel bad about what they did, that tells me a part of them knows they're wrong, but aren't ready to face it, right? And so that gives me hope that one day they'll face themselves. Because I know you feel bad for it. I can tell by the way you act. But yet you won't change your behavior because you're too prideful to face yourself and admit you were wrong because then you'd have to admit you were a bad person at some point. Which, by the way, being a bad person, everyone's a bad person at some point, guys. I hate to break it to you. Everyone's got a part of them that's like not the best. Every part of everyone feels like, am I a horrible person? You're probably not even a horrible person, by the way. Everyone was a 15-year-old emo kid who thought, I'm so dark. 
I'm so dark. I have an evil inside of me. I'm so dark. You're not that dark or deep. You're just 15. But everybody has a demon. They all fight inside of themselves. And on a spectrum, some people's demons are Dexter serial killing and some of them are being gay. You know, everyone has a different demon to fight, you know? And growth. And I personally don't believe that good growth comes from somewhere that is totally comfortable. Well, the future is female. I know. Look. No. Okay, well, Dave, on behalf of all women, we thank you so much for your support. Hey, would you maybe want to hang out sometime? You mean like a date? <laughs> yeah, like, like a date. Um... Bezos as me at 14 thinking I'm a sociopath because I thought BBC Sherlock was cool. Uh, Brittany at 15 thinking she was a psychopath or sociopath because I thought Dr. House was cool. Do you know what I mean? Like all of us have these thoughts of like, I must be so cool and edgy because like I identify with this character that I don't even identify with. I grew house so quickly. We all go through phases. Don't judge yourself too harshly. No, thank you. Okay. What? I'm wearing this shirt and you won't even let me nut! What is faux feminism and brochialism? Brochialism is not a new phrase. Whilst I can't find exactly who came up with it with proof, apparently according to this 2014 article, Benjamin Silverman came up with it in a Reddit exchange, but again, I haven't been able to find proof of this. It's the type of dude who would interject when someone's bringing up about a feminist issue and be like, ugh, there's way bigger issues to talk about, like class struggles, or say, oh, it's not as bad as other areas of the world. Good attempt at derailing there, bro, except for the fact that intersectionality is critically important to make sure that progress actually happens for everybody and by you actually trying to silence women when they're actually bringing up a feminist issue um that's actually like not being intersectional what i'm saying is that socialism doesn't exist without feminism okay it's all intersectional from my readings, from my observations, and from feedback from you, it kind of falls into two categories when we come to brochialism and faux feminism. You've got guys who are progressive, but patriarchal values are baked in. You know, they grew up with it and they haven't really questioned it all that much. They're left-leaning, but they also uphold traditional gender roles mm -hmm. and they kind of expect women to actually know how- And the moment they get challenged by a woman, they turn misogynistic and ableist. We know the types. We know the types. The moment they feel threatened by a woman in any capacity, ableist and misogynistic right away. Must be her mental health, must be some trauma. Maybe she just disagrees with you, my bro. No, no, she wouldn't disagree with me because if she really thought about it, she would see I came to the best, most base conclusion because I'm a logical person. You sure about that? To cook and clean and kind of just do that stuff automatically around the house. Same as when it comes to childcare because you know, that's how they were raised. They just know how to do it. <laughs> Important to note, this is not done with malice. It's just that patriarchal values are so baked in and they haven't actually been unlearned. And a little bit of selfishness here because you know, women's issues, trans issues, indigenous rights, BIPOC issues, like none of that stuff really directly affects them, especially if they're white men, let's be real. A lot of these people are white men. <laughs> it's not really been a core focus for them to learn about because it doesn't affect them. Whereas, you know, Karl Marx, oof, that affects everybody because it's a class struggle. But the thing is that talking about class struggle is actually very easy, especially these days. Um, but, you know, addressing the other stuff is more challenging and means that you need to self-reflect on yourself and also have those uncomfortable conversations with your friends, your colleagues, and your family members. And then you've got the second category, which is the one with the malice. This is where they actively dunk on misogynistic mm -hmm. men. You know, they set themselves apart by doing this. They probably actually know quite a lot of stuff. They're probably well educated. This comment she highlighted says, you're genuinely a good dude, Alex. Standing up for your friends without hesitation when they're uncomfortable is king behavior. Well, yeah, so much for that. Educated. They may even know some feminist history. They may even try and take the microphone when they attend a women's march. They know the right things to say and they sit on their pretty perch of possibly white saviorism here and expect people to be lining up to, you know, mm -hmm. play with their eggplant. And then they get involved with typically women and chip away at them slowly, breaking them down to make sure that they are nice and subservient. They silence their girlfriend when they speak up about something that makes them, the guy, feel uncomfortable. They say sexist or racist jokes, but you know, it's done in an ironic way, so it's totally fine. They're controlling of their partners and women in their lives, even if they're friends, as we'll be getting to. These are guys that can sadly be emotionally and physically abusive. However, the fact is, they're regarded as a good person, so people doubt them Aww. even more when when it comes to people even making a claim about it, even if they ever are able to come forward. But then the doubt goes towards the victim, especially if they're not a perfect victim. 
I want to show you this, which Lily made from Vulgar Memes, which I think explains things incredibly well. I'll try and link their Instagram below, but YouTube really doesn't like their username. They always age restrict my videos anytime that I am like plug it in their Instagram really? page. It's ridiculous. It's socialist interested dudes, but their oh. progressiveness ends where it directly impacts them. But they're also sure to expect furious jumping freely, right? Because that's what feminism did. Feminism meant that women are now free with their bodies and they earn their own money. So you don't actually have to put in as much effort in order to be able to get them to sleep with you. No, it was. Hold on. I want to read that to you guys. So if you can't see it, how to spot a brochialist. Okay. A fun, helpful guide. Defi my definition, left-wing men who value their politics as center to their identity, but treat women terribly and ignore political issues that affect women. So this guy, you know, he has a look. Um, it says a woman is killed every day, every three days by a man in the UK. No way. Are you sure that's true? Pressures women into sex. If they resist, he shames them for being not liberated. Hinge pictures him standing next to Karl Marx's grave. Invites his rapist buddy to parties, but it's fine because he paints his nails and goes to protest. Trans rights? Question mark. I don't know how much about. I don't know much about that, but I can explain communism to you. <laughs> Wait, trans rights? I don't know much about that, but I can explain communism to you again. <laughs> Treats black and brown women as an accessory, says widely misogynistic things, but clarifies white women in the hope that it makes it okay. Mm -hmm. I know exactly this type. This is what I'm saying. Know who you are in the story. Know who you are in the story. And this is a very specific person. I've made videos about this before. This is why we don't trust male feminists. Even if someone spouts the right, if they don't act the right way in their real life, I don't give a what you think you're, you're doing for women, if in your own personal life, you abuse them. I don't give a fuck what you think you're doing for civil rights if in the privacy of your home, you're a misogynist. Like, I don't give a fuck. And so this idea that people are like, it's good enough though, blah, 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 blah. No, if you make fun of Andrew Tate and you debate bro these people into a corner and you like own the conservatives, if in your own private life, you treat women poorly. I don't give a fuck and that own money so you don't actually have to put in as everyone's on a journey though and you should go to therapy and figure it out because honestly meditation would change your life thank you as much effort in order to be able to get them to sleep with you no it was actually about equality and respect and respecting all genders and bodies my dude <laughs> i'm sure that you can recognize these folk you can probably even identify some in your day-to-day -day lives this is why I'm calling them fake feminists, because they pretend to care about the stuff that we care about, and yet they actually treat the women in their lives pretty terribly. Oh, but these guys do really care about abortion rights and birth control access, but that's probably for a few more selfish reasons, what we'd really like to admit. <laughs> look, look, if Sneeko is a grifter for Islam because he keeps doing haram, then what are progressive debate bros who, who maybe argue with conservatives but still act like shit? It's the same thing. And I'm willing to meet these boys where they're at, but they gotta know they're bullshit. I don't give a how much you preach the Quran if you're living a haram life. I don't care how much you preach progressive values and civil liberties and all these other things and all these great things pro-LGBT if in, in your real life, you're literally abusing women. What do, what do I care what you think about these things? It's just interesting that we give liberals or progressives and our own camps like more of a pass because of what? Though I think progressives don't actually. I think liberals do. I think centrists probably do. Ooh, centrists do. Centrists give people way more of a pass than progressives. Actually, that's what's true. I blame centrists. It's their fault. <laughs> <laughs> and this isn't even new. Think about the sexual liberation movement that was happening in the late 60s and 1970s, you know? And so some guys back then were just like, I don't even have to take her out for dates now? Amazing. This is great. She can even pay for herself and it's called feminism. Amazing. I don't even have to change a thing. And so these particular guys were like, well, now I'm entitled to her body. Like, why shouldn't I be? And this is something which is touched on in the book Rough by Rachel Thompson and is still something that absolutely exists today. This is where men expected payback for anything from drinks to dinner. And when I say payback, I mean her body. And guys actually messaged them later saying, uh, can you Venmo me the $6.50 for the drinks? I mean, it wasn't really worth it, was it? The currency is furious jumping still. People have different wants in relationships and that's absolutely fine, which is why, you know, communication is an important thing. But paying for someone's drink does not mean that they owe you entry to their body. Mm -hmm. Equating getting to know somebody is not worth it is the issue here. It's this dehumanization which is the issue and it's the transactional view of somebody. What are you saying? Let's not make an issue out of it, okay? In fact, let's not talk about it at all. It happened. I, I don't understand. The hurt when you thought you knew someone. 
This can range from people in your own life all the way to famous people. Cody Ko has recently been whispered mm. about, and I do mean whispered about, it wasn't until two days ago when D'Angelo Wallace actually came up with his video, which I'll link for you down below in case you haven't seen it, that more people started to talk about it. Until then, the commentary crowd who loved to dunk on misogynistic men and call out things that are wrong in the world, they were very quiet, even though Tana Mojo, the other person in question here, actually came up with her podcast uh, addressing this a month ago. I hooked up with Cody Cole when I was 17 and he was 25. Mm. Yeah, it happened. Allegedly, because I cannot afford lawyers, Cody was 25 when he was actually at a party where Tana Mojo was 17. Yes, this Tana Mojo, the problematic Tana Mojo, the Tana Mojo that has definitely lived a life before she even hit the age of 20. Tana was a huge fan of Cody Ko and allegedly he was actually informed that she was underage, but then they went and uh, did furious jumping anyway. I just know that there's going to be people fixating on the fact that she was 17, so that's like nearly of age and like age of consent varies from state to state. I do not care. <laughs> um, I've already talked about these issues before. The thing is that he was in a position of power. She was 17, a 25 year old guy, already been told, allegedly, um, that they were underage. Mm -hmm shouldn't have done what they did, okay? I also recommend checking out this video from Rachel Oates. She posted it a few days before D'Angelo's video came out. Both really good. There is such an incessant need to have a perfect victim, otherwise doubt keeps on getting cast. The thing is that Cody Ko is actually kind of seen as a golden boy. He's seen as a good guy, you know? Like, the videos which he makes, he dunks on other people. He does make a whole bunch of stuff reacting to cringe things. It's just not my kind of humor, okay? It was a silence from the commentary community and also himself, which was the thing which kind it was my sense of humor. My partner often says, like, I have the sense of humor of a 13-year-old boy. And I do, because I am a boy. Like, I do. I like boy creators. I like watching them. I like the jokes. I loved Cody Ko. He was, like, a fix for me. And I stopped watching him the moment I did my stream about him and Tana and Colby. I haven't been able to watch him since because he ruined it. I'm ruined. It's That's it. I'm over it. I can't watch him anymore. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, with peace and love, you know, Purple with the super chat, thank you so much, says, for the cult proceeds, thank you for your tithing. A thousand billion trillion more dollars, and I might even get you up to level 69, guys, okay? If you donate a billion dollars, guaranteed, level 69, okay? Sh spread the word, spread the word. Um, I do like boy bubbles. I think they're exhausting. I don't relate to every part of them, obviously, but I think that it is, it is weird. I can't watch Cody anymore. It's ruined. I don't know why people think, again, this goes back to every man that throws a tantrum. They're like, why does this girl think badly of me when I told her I did all of these bad things? And I'm like, what do you mean? You just told me you did all of these bad things and you're not even sorry about it. And you blame the woman for it. These men will literally tell me these stories of them doing horrible things, blame women for their bad actions, and they'd be like, must be her borderline. Him, 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 must be her borderline. No way would she think badly of me, even though I just told her I just did these horrible things and I took no responsibility for them and I absolutely blamed the victims involved because I didn't want to take responsibility. But Cody Ko is only the most recent YouTuber to be found out to be like this. So you've got someone like I'm Alex. I used to actually watch Ugh. their videos. I think I watched them for like six months a few years ago. Uh, His work was very I never watched Alex. Very similar to Cody's, you know, reaction, commentary, dunking on very openly misogynistic people, you know, kind of like a good guy. But two exes of his revealed how allegedly he was abusive. There was a Google Oh, by the way, even though I could definitely make one of these videos, I won't. Because the victims involved already know, and everyone involved already knows, and it's their job to tell their stories. And I think this is very different. This, this is, these are my morals. People will say, like, if you know stuff, say something. I've already warned you. It's already on the internet. But if the victims involved don't want to come out with the story, all it would do is put more heat on them which I think is unnecessary because if you, what's already out there in the world about these content creators, if it's not enough for you to see the warning signs, then like, girl, what else could I say? There should be enough at this point, right? You should put it together, but maybe not. So that's the problem, right? The problem is like, when do you say something about these people? And it's like, well, you got to take into consideration how it's going to impact the victims. You've got to think about that. And I think if you don't, that's unfair. But I will say... Oh, you just wait for the victims to give me permission and I'm going to make a video. <laughs> you just wait and I will make a video, bro. 
You just wait. Full of messages sent between the two of them, where he uses racist and ableist slurs towards them. He was allegedly emotionally and verbally abusive and would also gaslight his girlfriend Annie, making everything about him. He also allegedly was physically abusive. And then you know what happened? People actually distanced themselves from him. Mm. You may also recall Eddie Burbeck's ex-best friend, Ooh. Gus Johnson. Oh. Now, his videos I used to watch all the time. Like I used to watch Gus all the time too, and I also fell off him after the controversy, but you know what? I can't even remember what it was now. I used to love Gus Johnson, but same. The controversy came out, and I just didn't want to watch him anymore after it. But I, for the life of me, cannot even remember what it was now. That's crazy. Maybe she'll explain it. I don't even remember what it was. Perry Tinkle says, Brittany, I've been in this cult for a while, and I still don't know what our objective is. Can we do a ritual or something? Um, You have to stay in the cult for at least 100 years in order for the secret to be revealed to you. Only the members who have dedicated a hundred years to the cult get to know the secrets. That's just how it works. I don't make the rules. That's just how it is. You can see this. I recorded this yesterday. You can literally see the point where I stopped watching his work. Mm. After Eddie found out what Gus did to his girlfriend and the horrible treatment towards oh. her. Oh. I didn't like her. I didn't trust her storytelling. Sorry. I remember this girl. I didn't trust her storytelling. It felt very dishonest at the time. We should go back and watch this one too. And the only reason it felt dishonest at the time, I remember it now, it's coming back. It's all coming back, it's all coming back to me now. Yeah, I didn't trust the storytelling. Interesting. I should go back and rewatch it. Um, but yeah, I remember her being very weird. Like the expectations she had of him were so outside of my, my own understanding of social expectations that I thought it was very weird, but it's a bubble. So we should, maybe we should go back and talk about that. Mm. He decided to no longer be friends with his closest best friend who he actually had this podcast with. They did so much together, but he couldn't stomach the repeated terrible behavior he was doing behind closed doors. Trust between us from me is completely broken and I just can't work with him in the future. I know that I at the time, along with so many others, were incredibly shocked by this because we always thought that Gus was such a good guy. And this is why I'm saying this is the stuff that's happening behind closed doors. And that's- Okay, you guys are saying, yeah, he was a bad boyfriend essentially during her ectopic pregnancy. Yeah, I remember it now that I saw Sabrina's face. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I... People are bad in tough situations, but also like him but also did he deserve to get canceled because he didn't show up properly i don't know i just feel like that's weird but also i don't remember the story clearly so maybe we should go back and revisit it that's always fun purple with another super chest is giving scientology vibes um scientology wishes bro honestly scientology scares the fuck out of me those people are so weird and i hope to god if you're in scientology you get out because honestly i saw a documentary on it and it made me want to cry it seems so scary that's why it's so much harder to find out about this stuff and why i'm so wary <laughs> of things and why so many of us are as well you may try and say mm. that i'm advocating for cancel culture and that's absolutely not no she's being so nuanced right now she's killing it she's being so nuanced i love this case the issue here is the fact that these guys were all positioned as like amazing good golden boys you know like they're the good guys right and then behind the scenes they were just doing i think i think what's difficult and i'm gonna say this too we shouldn't prop anyone up as the good guy because anything they do will not be good enough for us, right? If you prop somebody up as one of the good ones and the truth is, is like that doesn't even exist, one of the good ones is just to your standard, right? It's not even a real thing. But in this bubble, I get it because you think it's one of the good ones and it's not. But I think that's a standard we should stop putting on people because it doesn't even exist. You're not one of the good ones. The question is, how much of reality do we agree on? How much do we agree on this perception of reality? And the closest you are to me is the correct answer. That's what we all think. And that's why I think we all live in bubbles. And that's why we do congregate into societies and communities that think more like us, because then we feel safer, because we feel like this person can see me and understand my struggle, which is why diversity is beautiful, but it's kind of a myth. I do think diversity is sort of a myth. Because diversity implies a relationship with reality that differs from somebody else in a distinct and like specific way, which makes it almost impossible to look at one another with a sense of safety if 
given the opportunity, you would want them to think like you, which means you would want them to be, to be different than they are, which means you don't really believe in diversity. I'm cool with diversity. I like it, but that means you can't expect people to change because diversity implies some sort of difference from someone else, right? Now, I think there's a moral standard of diversity, and I do think that it is probably good to be pretty close-minded to certain people's outlooks while acknowledging that they can live that weird life over there, whatever that means, right? So I think it's interesting when we even prop these boys up who we do not know anything about as one of the good ones because of their aesthetic mostly. If you'll notice, what's his name? Gus Johnson and Cody Ko have a very specific aesthetic. No tattoos, pretty homely looking, not the hottest guy in the room, not the ugliest guy in the room, got like pretty you know, kind of homely girlfriends. Sabrina's a little bit more makeup-y, of course. But like the fact that Cody was with Kelsey, a lot of people trusted Cody more for dating Kelsey because Kelsey looks more homely, less like one of those LA girls who just want clout. So even the person that he dated and his homeliness made people think he was better than he was. But maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was just exactly what he was and no one wanted to acknowledge it. If Tana and Gabby and all these people knew about Cody Co then why didn't they make big, big videos about it? Why didn't they talk about it? Because no one knows. When are we supposed to talk about it? When are we supposed to say something? Because the truth is, you don't want to ruin someone's life, but you also want to take some, like you want to stop them from making more victims. So how do we do that? Or maybe we should ruin their lives. Do you think Cody Ko deserves to have his life ruined? I don't think anyone deserves to have their life ruined. I think people, society, ideally, which will never happen, will reach a point where people are treated accordingly, but not with a desire to torture. The irony of people thinking they're better people because they want to torture a bad guy, you're still torturing someone, dude. I don't get you. I mean, I do get you because I've been there. Absolutely. But I, you know, it's like, what are you doing? The truth is there is a place for Cody Code to be redeemed. And I want to go that path. Redeem him. But the irony is Cody's got to redeem himself. And he's doing basically everything possible to not do that. Probably because it's pretty intense right now. But he could redeem himself. But he probably won't yet. Maybe in the future. But also the path to redemption is very confusing right now. I'm not, I'm not sure what society expects it to be. Cognitive says Cody wasn't creating more victims though, was he? He was getting married to an adult. Yeah, that's true too. It's not like Cody's a serial problem. And also Cody's from Canada where the age of consent is different. So being, there was two girls at 17 Cody was allegedly with. I don't think that's exactly a pattern. I think that's more just like, culture and also like it is what it is but also some people have this thought like because Cody was in Florida he should have known it was against the law sure bro and I've never smoked weed in a non-weed state y'all act like the law is what the arbiter of morals are please like you've never sped in your car or done drugs or done anything it's like well Cody was in America so she should follow our laws instead of Canada's laws okay yeah sure like everyone does that, right? And Tana did that when she was drinking underage. The irony is people want to hold Brooke accountable for being racist at 17, but not Tana for um, drinking and partying and sleeping with people because you don't think 17 is an adult. You think it's an adult enough to know not to be racist, but not adult enough to know not to drink underage and have sex with adults. Nobody knows what they, nobody knows. Nobody knows what they really think about anything. 17 isn't old enough for much. That's why we have to protect 17 year olds because they're not old enough to understand a lot. Even when they think they, they, they do understand. I'm not going to hold Tana accountable for drinking underage. I did the same thing at 17. I'm not going to hold her accountable for an adult having sex with her or whatever. Like I'm not, that's not my business. I'm not going to hold Brooke accountable for parroting conservative talking points when she was a conservative. Be honest about the conversation. It's very difficult. And if you're going to take these people and throw them under the bus, you might as well throw yourself there too. <laughs> Ooh, funny. Completely horrible things. Allegedly, allegedly. I can't afford a lawyer. <laughs> you may recognize this slide, which I've come up with before, where I'm trying to recommend good male role models for guys to actually follow here on YouTube, you know. Do you realize how cautious... Let's see, Effie Signifier, shout out. Danny Gonzalez, shout out. Vlogbrothers, shout out. Hank, vlog, uh, Hank specific, shout out. Um, okay, I know a lot of these channels, but I don't watch them. Uh, it is, it's a risk. Oh, Noah Sampson, shout out. It's like a risk. This is a risk of who to recommend. Because honestly, you never know. 
I would be shocked if anything came out about Danny, FD, or the Vlogbrothers. But even the Vlogbrothers were getting, they were getting canceled on TikTok for not being more vocal about pro, uh, uh, Gaza for pro-Palestine. So honestly, like... Male role models for guys to actually follow here on YouTube, you know. Do you realize how cautious and careful I am when it comes to recommending a cis straight guy? I've always been very wary of the fake nice guy act, and I'm sure a lot of us can And by the way... What I'm f***ed up over it too. I'm, look, I'm coming from a perspective that's supposed to give you a little bit of wisdom, but also know that we don't have it yet. We don't know what to do. I think what Cody did was fucked up. I also know that it's way too f***ing common for me to think it's a Cody problem. And there's, so there's something in here that tells me like something's going on. I do think they're dumb though. I genuinely think they're stupid. And I think a lot of, I think a lot of people who commit crimes are. That's why they get caught. I think people who commit crimes, a lot of them are very stupid. And I think that's where classism plays a role in the education system. But more than that, I think if you're too spoiled, you're also stupid. Like that's the irony is I'm not sure it's this black and white. That's why I would love a professional. Cause look, this is the difference from philosophy and psychology. There is a psychology to this that I don't have the knowledge to access because I'm not a psychologist. There is a psychology to Cody Co and all of these people and it could be answered through a mixture of biology and, and and psychology that I can't answer. And then philosophy comes later. I know philosophy and psychology have a relationship. They're like cousins. They make out. I get it. But also, there is probably a biological drive that Cody and these people are having. And then on top of it, there is a psychological drive. And I want to know what it is. But I don't have the I didn't study psychology. I don't know. But I would love a psychologist, like a real person who loves the brain and how people operate to sit down with somebody and try to figure out, are these bad people? Are these predators? Or are they like doing some weird, like what is happening here? Because I'm not convinced it's as simple as saying they're a predator. You know, I, it feels too easy, but also I know too much. I, I know enough about uh, criminals, like Low-functioning sociopaths over high-functioning sociopaths. Low-functioning sociopaths are often jailed and imprisoned. And I think that's interesting. Like there's something, at least from the last time I read about it, and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Why did this, why does this pattern of the population end up caught? And like this, that's what I'm saying. There's something here that's really fascinating. And I know the internet's not ready to have that conversation, but hey, at least we're having it, I guess why that would be and I don't take your attention or trust for granted at all like I genuinely see this as a duty of care thing to be like as thorough as possible I also asked on Instagram for your experiences and wow thank you very much mm. for sharing with me I am sorry that so many of us have been through terrible things in life I've got a small selection to share with you today and as promised as Wait, always anonymous did this guy get cancelled no it's like a meme because I saw I see him on TikTok and I like his videos normally through terrible things in life. I've got a small selection to share with you today. And as promised, as always, anonymity is guaranteed. <laughs> I'm so glad I could actually say that. I always struggle with that word. <laughs> I used to have a friend who claimed to be a feminist and supportive of me being lesbian, but also expressed that he felt entitled to my body, like to be first in line if I ever got interested in any man, even if it wasn't him. He felt he does. Okay, can I say something else? I think people say things because they think they're supposed to say it a lot, like a lot, like hear me out because this, I am also, this is such a good video and I'm deeply interested in why people do things. I've noticed that people will make jokes about people being attractive because they feel like they're supposed to. And then they're just like a Lachlan who feel entitled to your body, reference to Kidology Lachlan. So then there's like the guy friends that are like entitled to your body in such a weird way that's dehumanizing. Then there are the people that think they're supposed to make a comment like you're so pretty because it's socially expected. And that's why I say like you have to know what bubble you're in and what's expected. Like people will say things I'm like even I will say things. Oh, my God, I will never say this out loud. But I said something once out loud because I thought I was supposed to. And everybody in the room looked at me like, oh, why did you say that? And I was like, I don't know. I just thought that's what I was supposed to say. And I was like, oh, my God. And I will never. I'm so glad. No, oh, I will never say it out loud what I said. <laughs> I just thought I don't know what I was thinking. But I was in this social situation and 
I just thought it was what I was supposed to say. I was so stupid in my defense. I had a drink, but not even. I remember thinking it in my head like, OK, now they said this. OK, now you say this. And I was like, OK. And then I said this thing and I was like, this will win me social points. And also it's funny, I think. And also I think this is what they would want me to say. And I was like, OK. And so I said it. And then I was like, oh. and the whole room was like, why would you say that? And I was like, I, I don't know. In the whole room, I mean, like three people. But I was like, oh, no. And then I realized like, okay, why did I say that? I said it because I thought it's what they wanted me to say in a way to build social credit, to signal to the group that I was one of them. And I was like, oh, I misread the social situation. And I said this thing. Okay. And this was like when I was like 21. Okay. This is 14 years ago. <laughs> Alice is bringing your autism is showing. Don't point out the obvious, Alice. Okay. So <laughs> I realized this was literally so many years ago. This is so far removed from the person that I am now. But I think that's a real experience people are having. And so I wonder about that as well. I think uh, people don't have discernment or wisdom. And I can't blame people for not having that when, you know, they're voting Trump. So. Served to be first since he was my friend. He once rented a car for a vacation. It was very hot. Two girls were walking by. He asked, should we ask them to get in? But he had this weird expression on his face. I took it literally and told him maybe we should because it's hot and maybe we can drop them somewhere close to both parties' destination. He was very surprised with my suggestion and I told him again with sarcasm, we won't be having furious jumping with them. And I laughed afterwards. But he said, well, if a girl gets into a guy's car, that's what she's looking for. I said, no, mm. it's to reach a destination and what gives you the also, okay, there's two types of humor that really throws me. I make a lot of obvious jokes in with close friends and family, like a lot of obvious jokes. So I make a lot of parody jokes. I notice that's my sense of humor. So my sense of humor is say the joke that you're not supposed to say, because if a person really meant it, it would be bad. But that's the joke. OK, so I like parody jokes. So this situation literally is awful. But then this as a joke is funny. So then my brain can has to figure out on social situations, are you making the obvious joke or are you actually making a joke that says you're actually the creepy guy? So if I was in the car with her, I'd be like, let's pick them up, orgy. And then the joke is, we're not actually gonna have an orgy with them, but the joke is a creepy guy would say that. But then they would have to know that I'm not a creepy guy. And so I'm not saying that, I'm saying the obvious joke. But if you're, they don't know that, they're gonna think you're literally saying something that you don't mean. So the dilemma is like, is he making the joke that's a joke or is he making the joke that's literal? And if the opportunity came up, he would take it. But also, is he hoping for it? And that's the like social mess we're all like navigating through. Like, are you making the quirky like joke because, you know, that's what the like the person who's bad would make the joke or are you the bad person making the joke? Hmm. Audacity to think this way. And he got very offended. I met a guy last year who was a self-proclaimed feminist, aware of the problems in society, had a bunch of queer friends, women friends, and genuinely apologized when he did something wrong, which was a first for me. I'm Eric Ace and already have sexual trauma. So when he made advances, I was like, that's never gonna happen. And he said, no problem, we can just be friends. Anyway, he kept trying to get me to sleep with him, asking for nudes under the guise of empowerment. Put Ew. me in multiple sexual situations that I specifically said no to and ended up straight up essaying me. He Whoa. then went to a feminist protest on Women's Day a few weeks after I ended contact because of the essay. Also, the cherry on top was that he dated a girl when he was 22 who was 15 at the time and legit didn't see the problem. But I was constantly telling myself, no, Ooh. but- that's the problem. You should know there's a problem if you're in your 20s dating somebody who's a teenager, like with a big age gap, like 22 and a 15 year old. You should know there's a problem there. If you don't know there's a problem there, why were you raised that way? Is it normalized? Did your mom and dad have the same relationship? Did nobody ever tell you it was weird? Are you hiding it? Are you are you aware that it's weird? Are you you know what I mean? Like, that's the thing too. Sometimes I meet people and they're like, oh, that's how my mom and dad were. My mom and dad love my relationship. They're big fans. Okay, well then how the fuck would they do anything different? But if it's a person who's like, hey, don't tell anyone, but like my girlfriend's 15. It's like, oh, what do you mean don't tell anybody? 
Oh, so you know it's f***ing wrong. You know you shouldn't be doing this. Well, then that's f***ing different. That's a different circumstance, right? If a person is born in a bubble and that's all they ever know, why would they do anything different? Like, why do you think you would do anything different? Because you have this magic thing that says like, oh, I would have done something different because look at my life. Like, oh, how f***ing privileged are you, bro? But at the same time, if they're hiding it, if they're ashamed of it, if they know people would look down on it, oh, what are you doing? Now, at the same time, that's how a lot of gay people feel. A lot of gay people feel like they have to hide it. They're ashamed of it. If people found out, they would be very angry. And then they wonder, am I doing something wrong because I'm gay? And this is where my borderline came from, which is in remission. Is as a gay kid growing up, I was like, am I a bad person? Like my demons were about being gay. Growing up, the darkness inside of me was like, am I gay? Oh my God, what does that mean? I like girls and I'm like eight years old. And like, what does this mean? And then I had to ask myself, am I a bad person because I like women? And then that was a whole complex. So we need to separate the people that are having a complex around being gay and the people that are trying to have kids, but also don't see them as kids because in their heads, they're peers. I'm telling you right now, there are stupid men out there who are 25, who literally think 15 year olds are their peers. They're really mature for their age, go. They're really mature. There are people who are in their 50s. Dating 22-year-olds, they're very mature for their age, though. I'm 65. I'm dating a 21-year-old. They're very mature for their age, though. Okay, there's something wrong with you. Or there's something very human about you. What is it? Why, how did you get, like, maybe it's, again, it's my bubble, where, like, your elders are supposed to reach elder age and into their wisdom, and you're supposed to be wrinkly, and you're supposed to have the wisdom of the tribe. You're not supposed to be fucking 20-year-olds. Okay? You're not, all these old people that are fuck 20 year olds. Like that's not, that wasn't the goal. That wasn't the goal. The goal was for you to be an elder in which you would bestow wisdom on the young people. But see how none of these young people have wisdom. That's what I'm saying. None of these young people have elders to go to. Do you think Cody Coat was calling his dad and be like, yo dad, I want to fuck Tana Mojo. Who's like 17 dad. Can I fuck 17 year old dad? And I don't know if his dad would have been like, Cody, make better decisions. Or if his dad would be like, fucker, Cody. That's what I'm saying. What is that? And I guarantee you, no matter how good your parents are, they're going to miss a mark. Most parents aren't thinking, I should explain to my 25-year-old kid why he shouldn't have the 15-year-old. Because a lot of parents think, oh, they'll just figure that out. Do you know how many parents I talk to that are like, oh, my kid will figure it out? No, you have to teach morals to your kids. They don't just figure it out. And then you have to be consistent enough with your morals so they trust you as like an older figure who knows what they're doing to some extent until they find out you're a person and you have mistakes and you make mistakes. And blah, blah, blah. I guarantee you, Cody did not go to an elder in his community and say, should I have said this kid? And I guarantee you, a lot of the people having midlife crises in their 40s and 50s and 60s buying Ferraris, watching Andrew Tate and having sex with 20 year olds are probably not gonna call the elders in their community because they think they're the elders. Well, you're not acting like it. You're not acting like an elder. You're acting like a child. But he knows the terms and stuff. Why would he do exactly what we talked about? He was really good at the, no, it's your choice. It's okay to say no, but then still push until I give in. He genuinely didn't see a problem with that. Huge yikes. And I've sadly saved the worst for last. One oh of you talked about your friend who was involved with a guy. This was back in the 2010s. He was a vocal feminist lefty, super knowledgeable type. And he was involved with many girls at the same time, labeling this as polyamory, as this was pretty new Ugh. in Poland, at least in the wider zeitgeist. And he was kind have counted almost like a celebrity the douchebag polyamory guy the worst purple says cody was legit told what was up and still did it no no, no. here's the problem though cody's from a place where that's normal like i i need people to hear that i agree with you i was mortified when gabby hannah's clip came out but then we're only viewing cody through an american lens that's the problem cody isn't american and i think Abba and Preach's video was a nice reminder of that because just a reminder that like Abba was also 17 when he was with a woman in her 20s because it was in Canada, it's legal. Or the fact that Kai Sinat, his camera guy, was just outed at 20 texting a 17 year old, but it's legal where they're from. So yes, we're not using the law to tell us what morals are, but a lot of people do. A lot of people say, well, if it's illegal, I can do it. If it's legal where I'm from, I should be able to do it. Or hey, if it's illegal, I'm still gonna do it. So the dilemma is like, I was mortified when Gabby told that story for sure. But then I look at these men and I think, okay, there's gotta be a reason you think it's okay. And a part of it I'm telling you right now is the philosophy of it. You cannot face yourself. You are, you, you like have allowed your ego to get so big. You can't face yourself. 
Sneeko and all these people, I'm telling you right now, they're not at a good place in their life, right? They're not at a good place in their life. And so again, no matter how much they pretend to be, they're not responsible, right? Kay says that now they're viewing Cody from the 2024 internet culture where people are more consent and power dynamic uh, aware. Oh, absolutely. You have to remember, like you have to Im imagine where he is, what it feels like, like what it, like we should want to change these things and move people forward. But first we have to explain to them why it's even bad when they have a biological urge, they have a cultural expectation, they have uh, people around them that are engaging in it, even if some people disagree. So you can listen to every conservative that tells you not to be gay. Again, being gay is natural, but so is wanting to have sex with somebody you're friends with. And as far as Cody and Tana were concerned, they were friends. Remember that everything we do is in our nature, even the bad stuff. That's why this, this idea that like, oh, it's natural, so it's okay. No, we wanna harm reduce. Natural is everything that we are. Unless you think humans are somewhat not natural. Natural is just everything we do. The question is, can we be a higher part of our nature to be kinder to nature itself? Can we cut down less trees or grow, you know, do it appropriately? Can we allow people to grow to a certain age before we engage with them? It doesn't even matter if Tana was 25. If it was an inappropriate situation, he shouldn't have done it. But how would he know that if he didn't have the language? How many people in the debate sphere laughed at me when I said we should negotiate consent? How many of you fuckers laughed at me? When they were like, Brittany's so funny. She cuddles with her friends and negotiates things. <laughs> but these people aren't all predators. They're stupid and they're lazy and they don't want to, quote, ruin the passion of asking, can I kiss you before I do? Reminder that there are people on this space, in this debate space, not my space, I'm not in the debate space, but you know what I mean, who literally laugh. Brittany's so funny. Oh, Brittany's just living in La La Land. Ha <laughs> ha, Brittany, Brittany negotiates consent with her friends. <laughs> Brittany negotiates consent with her husband. <laughs> 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 yes, I ask my husband. I don't just assume. Yes, are you in the mood? Would you like to? Is it okay? Can I kiss you? Can you, you want to kiss me? Okay, a lot of the time I just make the kissy face. But yes, I want to make sure. Do you have time? Can I come into your office? Are you on the phone? It's called consent. You're just checking in. You're just saying, are you good? When I call my sister, hey, are you free right now? I'm asking consent. Hey, do you have a moment? I'm asking consent. So for all these debate bros and all of these men that laugh at me for wanting people's consent, okay. I don't think they're all predators, but I think that's why they're toxic. I think Cody's toxic. I think Tana was toxic. It doesn't excuse what Cody did though. Tana being toxic isn't consent for Cody to take advantage. You being in someone's bed and naked doesn't mean they can't revoke consent. Again, I don't think people understand how to revoke consent when you're in the middle of it, but it's very simple. You're having sex. Your tummy starts to hurt. You're like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. My stomach hurts. I actually think I have to go to the bathroom. Yeah, that's called adulting. Sometimes your tummy hurts in the middle of sex. You gotta go run to the bathroom. That's a consent thing. And you might be thinking, oh, but that's easy. You're like, tummy hurts. Okay, you're in the middle of sex and you start to get a headache. Hey, my head is pounding. I'm so sorry, I don't know what's up. Can we stop? Because all this bouncing isn't helping. Consent is about communication. Hey, this is how I'm feeling right now. I don't think I can keep going. For some reason I'm hurting. I think it's my endometriosis. Hey, I really wanna have sex with you, um, but I can't get it up right now. Oh, it's okay. Hey, I really wanna have sex with you. I'm just so tired, I worked a long day. Hey, this is really nice. But is it okay if we just kiss tonight? These people act like if you don't have sex all the way, it's a rejection. It's just a communication of what we can do in the moment. So again, there's so many layers to this. Where they've come from, how they communicate, how you even talk about consent. If you think it's funny to negotiate consent, okay, well then now I have to talk to you in the bubble you're in. Okay, how do you harm reduce who you're having sex with if you can't verbally communicate with them? Check if they're sober. Was Tana sober that night? Probably fucking not. Do we think Tana was sober that night with Cody Co? Probably fucking not. So now you're telling me he probably, allegedly, had sex with a drunk 17 year old. That's what I'm hearing. So ways to reduce harm if you won't want to ask for verbal consent. See if they're sober. See if they're extra tired. If somebody is too tired, I won't have 
sex with them because I don't know if you're consenting and your tiredness or not. Because people make really dumb decisions when they're really tired. Ask their friends, see if they have contraceptives. But did they even have safe sex that night? Did he raw dog her? There are so many things that could have possibly gone wrong that night. There are so many things at play. Was Cody also drunk? Does that mean Tana took advantage of him and broke his consent? Maybe Tana had sex with Cody. Who was more drunk? What was happening? There are so many things that go into this. Anyways, let's keep going because we're almost at, we're at my bedtime and we're still not halfway done. So now we got to finish. Let's go. Educating the public on polyamory and was so looked up to by people, but he somehow only wanted to date, you know, really young women, you know, 18, early 20s maybe. And he was a professor, so he had to be at least 25 years old at this point when he was dating 18 year olds. And not only that, but he had all of the women do all the housework, you know, the cooking, the chores and everything. And they were happy to as he's so busy and important, but none of them could actually be in relationships with anyone else that he didn't approve of, especially not man. It was all his rules, his way. And sadly, he was also physically abusive too. I'm positive that polyamorous viewers are really offended at them trying to say that this was polyamory because it certainly is not. Polyamory is all about very clear and open communication, respect for each other's boundaries, and actually talking through well, things. It's ethical polyamory. There's a lot of unethical polyamorous people in the world, just like there's unethical monogamous people. As somebody who practiced polyamory for 10 years, because it is a lifestyle choice, there are lots of people that have that dis that do unethical non-monogamy, right? And you have to do ethical non-monogamy, ethical monogamy. Some people are just unethical. Some people have bad morals. It's incredibly respectful. Or different morals, if only. At least from friends that I have that are polyamorous, okay? So yeah, don't get it twisted. What he was doing was not polyamory. That was actually just manipulation and abuse. Weirdly, he also made it onto the news. Ugh. He's got a look. What a woman. So why does this type of guy go after strong, independent women then when he actually wants someone that's submissive? Well, let's go quote Trevor Noah, shall we? Oh. The way my mother always explained it, the traditional man wants a woman to be subservient, but he never falls in love with a subservient woman. He's attracted to independent women. He's like an exotic bird collector. He only wants a woman who is free because it's his dream to put her in a cage. I've already heard the term woke fishing, right? It's like catfishing, but you know, your entire personality and like morals and beliefs. The term was coined by Serena Smith in this Vice article from 2020. She'd been seeing a guy who came across as very quote, woke, but when she went vegan, he sent her a barrage of hateful messages and said, oh God, you're not going to become one of those vegan feminists, are you? She was completely caught off guard as this was the opposite to the person that she was seeing, a progressive good guy. Political and moral beliefs have come more and more into the forefront, which I personally think is a really good thing for people to, you know, be socially aware and actually talk about this stuff. I think that's a positive. You know who I wonder about is Hassan all the time because um, I've never heard any woman talk badly about Hassan. I've never heard him have any issues. I actually think better of him because of it. And I've actually warmed up to him a lot during this political season. I still have a lot of my original opinions about Hassan, except that I do, I do, you know, I like a boy bubble, but what can I say? But I always wondered this about Hassan Piker. He has such a good reputation with women. And that makes me like him better. But I also wonder if he purposely like doesn't date and keeps to himself because the possibilities of it going badly for him are pretty high, but I don't know his situation. I don't know if he's much of a dater. Maybe he just doesn't date. Maybe he's asexual. I don't know anything about, I, I don't even know if he's into women. Wait. Yeah. I don't No, He is. Cause he's not gay. Cause I remember I, I listened to a podcast. He is, he is straight. So I've never heard anything bad about him. And so I was like, Oh, that makes me like him better. 100%. It, it just does because he looks exactly like the kind of guy that is a fake progressive. He looks exactly like the kind of guy that's a liar, but he might not be. He might just be kind of a progressive boy that doesn't fuck. I don't know. I've just never heard anyone say anything bad about him. Discourse says, I think his old videos for Young Turk show his true personality. Um, I'm not gonna judge somebody from 20 years ago though, right? I would rather judge Hassan for who he is now than who he was in college. Because like that frat boy personality, I don't know if that's truly who he is, but man, those Young Turk videos are from like, what, 10 years ago? Are we really gonna judge somebody from a decade ago? 
I would hate to be judged for who I was 10 years ago. So I'm not going to do that for Hassan. I don't know if that's his true personality. I've watched a lot of him recently and I don't know. I don't know. But until I hear women talk badly about him, I might like him better for it. Yogi says Hassan has talked about having sex with uh, corn stars. I mean, good for him. But the issue is, as I've talked about in previous videos, is that women are actually leaning more left, especially when we're mm -hmm. younger. Mm -hmm. And then younger men are actually leaning more right, which is causing a bit of a problem with the dating pool. And as the years have gone on, people are less willing to actually date someone who's got differing political beliefs to them. Something which makes perfect sense to me. But again, it's... <laughs> It's stopping eggplant action. What? I freaking march for you. You won't get down on this. Ew. Layla from La 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 Let Me Explain and Instagram, who I have shouted out many times and I'll also have link for you down below, they've actually said this. A lot of recent political movements are based on moral values. These are things that you cannot agree to disagree on because they have a direct impact on the welfare of other human beings. And the mm. thing is that this is true, right? And I always say that people can learn, change, or grow at any age. However, that actually requires people to actually have some self-reflection and actually do the work, do the Hold on, hold on. I love this already. This video is so good. K Ray D says he he dates and is into women and believes his I believe his last girlfriend he spoke about publicly was also a uh, adult worker. Oh, interesting. Okay, we love it. An open minded king over here. Okay. I don't know how progressive he could be in that traditional sense, but I mean, you know. K says, isn't that what's happening right now to Cody? Or is him still being friends with that guy that's making Tana stuff change the present day pre representation of him? Yeah, probably. Like, Kobe, I, the problem is, is like, I think Kobe graped that girl, in my opinion. Based off of what I read about the case, I think it's very unlikely that he didn't. Now, whether or not he processed it as a graping could be different. I wasn't inside of his head, but I think getting a girl drunk, filming her while they were having intimacy, and then for the girl to wake up and not remember anything, and then to be ostracized from the school, for Colby to have a recording on his on his camera, which he liked to cops about, like I, with all of my known judgment, I would say that it's very unlikely that he didn't grape that girl which means it's most likely that he did. And in order to give the benefit of the doubt to Colby in that situation, I would need to be inside of his head. And I can't I can't offer that to him or anyone in that situation who's willing to get somebody drunk and record them. Like I can't give you the benefit of the doubt in that situation. It's too bad. And I'm not the one to do that, but maybe a therapist can, maybe a priest can. Maybe somebody else can. And so the fact that Col uh, Colby was in Cody's wedding, they're friends, the fact that they've never talked about it and he's never, you know, I get it. But also I, it's a lot. That's a lot. I think I'd feel very uncomfortable. I would never let that person in my house. I just couldn't trust them. But also it's not my job to trust them. We're not friends. Now, if Cody wants to trust him, that's one thing. He's allowed to do that. I think people who have done those things can seek redemption in some capacity. If we didn't think that was true, like that's fine. But I believe in restorative justice. I believe people can get better. I believe you can be a bad person yesterday and a good person today. I just think the road to doing that is going to need a lot of intervention that I doubt Colby has gotten, right? Colby is the guy who's friends with Cody. And that's why Cody's reputation is being tainted as well. Because Cody not only has sex with multiple 17-year-olds allegedly, but also is friends with somebody who, like, took advantage of a woman. So I just, you know, it's, mm, yeah. The change. Um, but you can just put on a mask instead and then get your eggplant played with. So why would you actually do the hard work? This wanting of a strong woman makes me think of the very controversial 2015 study which came out. The Shriver Report snapshot, an insight into the 21st century man. It was conducted on 818 men in the USA about the difference in what men want between a wife and a daughter. They were instructed to pick the top two to three qualities that they wanted in a wife or an adult daughter. Noting here, this is about an adult daughter, not a child, an adult. Intelligence took the number one spot for both, with 81% for the adult daughter and 72% for the wife. Independence was the number two spot for the daughters at 66%, but only 34% of the wife. So what was the number two spot for the wife? Attractiveness at 45%. 
which was only 11% for their daughters. Strong took out the number three spot for daughters at 48%, but only 28% for the wife. The other attribute that was also at 34% for wife was sweet, but that was at 19% for their daughter. And quickly glancing at the homemaker stats, 14% for wives, but only 5% for daughters. Nearly triple the difference there, fellas. Looking at these graphs side by side, daughters' intelligence, independence, strengths, and principles all got over a third of the votes. For wives, intelligence, attractiveness, independence, and sweetness got over a third of the votes. These are two very different women that are wanted. Mm. Now, yes, I would call this a small study, but it's an interesting snapshot to actually look at because I think it reflects quite a lot about our society and dating world. And I want you to read that quote back from Trevor Noah one more time. This is why it's important to know who you're dating because the same people in the Trevor Noah example where men want, they go after independent women, but want subservient wives. There is another bubble where women want sensitive men, but they want masculine appearances so the bubble difference is in that so people will say i want a man who's kind and sweet but i want him to look masculine and manly but without the the parts of the masculinity that i think is gross right and the dilemma is people are like you can't have those two things maybe you can't maybe you can have a side of it like uh it's 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 a hard thing like look i'm never going to be a sweet subservient wife you can't ask for an independent woman that has a career and loves her job and me to be subservient. I'm sorry. The, I can't do both. I can't do both. So, but a lot of these men want to tame me. Over the years, a lot of men would approach me and be like, I bet I could tame you. You might be a brat, but I could tame you. I bet I could hold you down. And I'm like, get out of my face. And that's always what I hear. Oh, I could tame Brittany. I could take her. Uh, I don't want to be tamed. Thank you. Go, go. You have to decide what you want, and then you have to decide if you have like someone who can do both. 45% of men said that compared to their father's generation, it's harder to be a man in their own generation. The reasons cited were most commonly women's changing role in society. Here's some quotes. In my dad's day, women stayed at home and the men worked. Now both men and women work in the same area as men do, so it's hard for us to be men. Ugh. If you stand up as a man, it's taken as putting fee- It's hard for us to be men because women did something different. This is what I mean by know if you're externally motivated motivated or internally motivated. I do not give a f what men are doing. I never think about it. It's not my business. When I think about what I'm doing as a woman or a man, I never think about what men are doing. The fact that these men don't know how to be men unless women are being women. What is that? What is that? Is that external motivation? What is that? I never think about it. And maybe it's the fact that like, what is gender? Gender is a construct. So, like, I don't even know what this is. And these people are like, I'm an independent thinker. Okay, well then think for yourself without a woman needing to do something for you to make a decision. This is a part which I personally found most interesting, which was barely reported on. I, I legit read so many different reports on this. 67% said their father was their male role model, regardless of what age that participant was. This is not necessarily a bad thing as there are some amazing dads out there. Like I would count Brandon's dad as one of those people, right? But I've known so many guys across my life, be they friends, exes, colleagues, like anything like that. I've known so many of them and be like, oh God, my dad was a terrible person. Whether it was the fact that he he was working all the time. He was neglectful. Mm. He was um, sadly abusive in a bunch of cases, actually. And don't forget about that generational divide mm. because there are different expectations of what it means to be a man by each generation. That was also shown in this study, too. So I found this really interesting that their male role model continued to actually be their father. Or it was another family member, if not their father. Another key thing which was underreported on, except for on Patrick Wanis' website, was that 56% of men agree that, generally speaking, men are more concerned about making good impressions and earning respect of other men than earning the respect of women. Worryingly, with 67% of 18 to 49 year old men feeling this way, and it actually went down to 47% of men aged 50 and older. So it's the younger generations of men that are actually more concerned about getting the respect of other men as opposed mm. to women in their life. I was really not expecting that result, but when you look around us, it does kind of make perfect sense, right? You know, Matt Reif, um, I Ugh. had actually scripted a whole bunch of stuff, but then Shan Spear came up with this amazing video, and so um, I'm not going to say anything further other than link their video for you down below because you should absolutely go and watch it <laughs> but the res respect that he was getting from women wasn't actually enough for him he didn't feel like he got any respect because you know 
it's kind of like what you get anyway for just being a man in this world. You're automatically going to get respect from women. But you felt like you needed to earn the respect of other men. And the way to do that was to actually put other mm-hmm. women down. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that we've seen this in our own lives as well. There's something here. I think girl bubbles can fall into this paradox as well, where they seek the approval of other women in also a toxic way. So they like shit on men or shit on other women. Again, we have to know why we're doing things for the right or wrong reason. I'm going to be real with you. It feels good to have a girl audience. There's something about that that does feel good. But just like I don't care what men are doing, I don't care what women are doing. I don't care what your gender is doing. I'm just doing me. Do I love having a female audience? Yeah. Do I feel like I get a lot of validation from that? Yeah. To be honest with you, I would think, I think if I had a mostly male audience, I would think I was doing something wrong. I would because I'm more progressive and I'm more feminist and I'm more sex positive. So I should have a female audience. Maybe that won't look the same in the future, but men generally speaking, aren't those things. Every time I said sex positive, people laughed at me. The boy bubbles think I'm funny. Ha ha. Brittany's so funny with her quirky words. They're so dumb. They have no idea what we're talking about. Of course, I want women to be in my audience. At least they read books. At least women actually care. At least they're doing the work. At least a lot of the women in my audience are even educated. Like, yeah, of course I want them in my audience. Of course I want them to be my viewers. It tells me that I'm doing good work. And I think there's something about that. But I know men might feel this way as well. Like, oh, I'm so glad I have like a 40% group of women watching me. Right? Like Noah Sampson, I think he was 60% men, 40% women. Versus like a Sneeko was like 95% boys. And like a Destiny was 95% boys. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like if I had a 95% male audience, I'd be like, holy fuck, I'm doing something wrong. But also if I was a man, maybe I'd feel like I was doing something right, but probably not. I'd probably want to be a Noah Sampson who's at least getting almost half women. Cause I'm like, okay, then at least I'm, you know, targeting those audiences. So again, it's interesting how we seek validation, but also it just lets us know if we feel like we're doing the right thing. Like I'm really, I feel really good that my Instagram is mostly women, that all of the content across the board is mostly female audience members song right and it also talks about the shame of being a woman who dates a man that turns out to be bad from the many people who have reached out to me the shame felt for actually falling for a guy who turned out to be Mm. manipulative who turned out to be a terrible person that's hard you think you're dating a guy who's progressive you think you found a guy who's cool and then you find out he's a big massive douchebag and he serial cheats lies and gaslights people yeah it sucks oh well you get over it you learn person who turned out to be abusive that shame was actually so huge for you because you're like i'm a strong independent woman how come i fell for it like how how did i not see this how was i so tricked like how did i just obey all of his whims how did i do all of this stuff why did i stay and all of this self-blame that happens right it's also because um we kind of do that to each other. The way a man treats you in a relationship is social status amongst women. Making the woman in the bad place, if that makes sense, as opposed to being like, oh, he's doing the bad things. He needs to change this stuff. Instead, it's like, well, why didn't you leave? Why aren't you gone? You should just be single instead. Women are still paid far less, and actually intersectionality comes into play hugely here because if you're disabled, you're definitely going to get paid less. If you're BIPOC, you're going to get paid less. Job security, disability, health issues, there are so many issues that actually come into play and also as I talked about in this video here it is super expensive to try and be single because the world was built for who married people hold on hold on this narrative I can't I can't with it and maybe that's because we're single income household and my income is that single household income so many women tell me this they're like life is so hard as a single woman like uh, you know the world's built for two What am I doing? I've never thought that. In all the years I've made enough money, I've never thought I wish I had a man's income. I've just never thought about it. It's never crossed my mind. You know, what would really help is if we had a second income. But to be fair, you know, who doesn't love more money? But I just never thought the world is built for two. I wish I had more money. I guess if you're getting all of the things, like I'm not worried about going on vacation. I'm not doing those things. That's true. I don't, I'm very low maintenance. So maybe it's that. Like, I don't get it. Hayda says that he's doing your house cooking. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's true. He's doing your house work and cooking, right? He is, he is doing those things. I mean, to be fair though, like I've lived single and I've paid my own rent and I haven't had a roommate before. (laughs) It depends like on what's, I think what it is, is like your level of expectation for living. I think that's the key because obviously he does a, he does a lot. I don't want to take any of his credit away from him. Like he does so much. It, it, he makes my life so easy. Like he makes it really possible for me to work full time 
and I love my job and I never have to worry about anything because he does everything. So I don't want to take that away from him, right? He's a wonderful person. Like, I'm very lucky I married her. With that said, I also think it's our lifestyle decision. Like, we're not going on vacation every year. So yes, if we were wanting to go on vacation every year, we would need a second income. If we wanted to buy a house tomorrow, we would need a second income, right? So absolutely, you're right that if the lifestyle was specific, we would need that second income 100%. So maybe it's that as well. Where like in my head, I'm thinking, well, could I do as a single person? But, you know, now that I say it out loud and I'm brainstorming. Yeah, I think that those things would be different for sure. Hayda says I live on my own, but would appreciate help around the house. I think you're right that ultimately because he does so much and he really like, I mean, I can't even start to name all the things that he just takes off of my plate that I don't have to worry about. It, it is a full time job of stuff. And so I appreciate that so much. I would never not want to be grateful for that. And then more or less, because we don't have these expectations of wanting to own a car or go on vacation or do these things or have kids, we also don't need that second income. So to be fair, and to be fair, the reason we don't have those things is because we don't have a second income because it doesn't like vibe well for us. If we had a second income, maybe like if we were richer, sure, we'd get a car. Why not? But I'm not buying a car unless it's like, paid in cash and completely convenient to have it. So to be fair, now that I'm recontextualizing this conversation, I'm going to recontextualize it in my head as what they mean to say is if you expect this standard of life that involves a car and maybe kids and maybe a vacation once a year, yes, you would definitely need two incomes, 1000%. And a new wardrobe and new clothes and you're not budgeting every euro, yes. Maven says, I think the core of what people mean when they say this is that it's easier to live if you have some help at least. That is true. I mean, honestly, if God forbid my partner ever passes away, like I would move near my sister and my mom so I could have a village and we could all hang out together and that would be nice. And I wouldn't do things on my own. I'd probably ask my mom to come to the doctors with me because I'm a baby. (laughs) I'm just a sweet little baby, you know? Hayda says, but you're right. But a single person can support their self on one income. I, I think, yeah, I think at a certain standard of living, you're probably fine. But if you really want to have more freedoms, yeah, a second income is always great, right? Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we had that conversation. Help me recontextualize it in my head. And I know that I'm saying this as a married person. That doesn't mean that I can't recognize like the privilege of the fact that I'm married to, you know, luckily a nice person. And also the fact that I'm very well aware of the... She's married. I didn't know she was married. Social injustice in the world. And we can't forget that social stigma which surrounds women who is, quote, weak in their relationship, especially if friends or loved ones were shaming them prior. Like, who do they have to turn to now? People who are victims in abusive relationships Mm. have a really hard time of leaving. In fact, leaving those relationships is the most dangerous time for them. So this judgment and abandonment only actually hurts victims more. To me, this is almost like another Mm. version of victim blaming. See, that's a good psychological difference. Um... Often I get asked this question and I really do think I don't like the question because I think it's dishonest. Um, And this is no shade to the people who originally asked me the question, but people will be like, what do you think the difference between philosophy and psychology is? Well, philosophy isn't going to help you understand and contextualize your abusive relationship and have to understand why you're staying in an abandonment situation, in a situation because you don't want to be abandoned. That's what a psychologist would help you do. Like to me, Asking the question, like, do you know the difference between philosophy and psychology feels like, it feels like a trick question. What do you mean? In a situation where somebody's in a toxic relationship and they're running through the same cycle over and over again, because they have a complicated situation, that's a psycho- like a psychological problem in some capacity. Like a therapist would really help you with this. Philosophy is not going to help you right now, girl. We got to break generational curses. We got to know why we're doing this. Like that is something a therapist can really help you with. That is like, obviously. So my brain is like patterns of abusive behavior that stem from childhood trauma. See a therapist, see a psychologist, see somebody who studies the brain and like our habits study. What do you mean? Like, what does philosophy have to do with that yet? We can't do philosophy stuff yet. We're not even there. And then my brain is like, why are you asking that question? And again, this is no shade to the people who ask the question, but sometimes I feel like, why are you even asking me that question? It feels like a gotcha because you know how people always accuse me of doing therapy and not philosophy it's like 
I, if I had a victim come to me and say, I'm, I'm an abusive cycle of a toxic relationship and I can't get out of it. I would say, go to psych, go to a therapist, go to somebody who can help you deconstruct this. Cause I can't help you do that. That's so above my pay grade. I'm here to ask you who you are, you know, and like a different kind of way. So it's kind of interesting, I think, but this is like a good example of it. Like what, how, how would I know how to help you with this? See a professional. I mean, because it's like, oh, you're with such a problematic guy, like, because that's a reflection on you, because you're a woman, you know better than them, because, you know, we are trained to actually make men be better, right? <laughs> How many rom-coms have taught mm. us that? How much of our life messaging, yep. like in yep. this video here, has taught us that, that we're meant to be the tempered ones, we're meant to be the calming force, we're meant to be the educational force, never the nagging force, but definitely the one to just go easy on him, coax him over to, like, learn a little more about mm. stuff you know and so it really doesn't surprise me that we've also internalized this sort of messaging but then when we're going against each other I'm just like I think we're missing a little bit of a piece of the puzzle here which is you know recognizing like the systemic oppression that is actually still at play and the fact that security is actually a really big thing and actually picking up all of your stuff and leaving is an incredibly hard thing for people to do mm -hmm. especially as like women's refuges keep getting underfunded and uh Gosh, I could go on for ages, but I think this video is probably long enough, right? When reading Buff by... Maven says philosophy isn't going to help you recognize your cognitive distortions. I think that that's the thing that... That's why I feel like I can't engage sometimes with these debate bros. Because when you ask somebody that question, it feels... And maybe this is me, just how my brain works. It's almost like offensive. You're asking me what's the difference between math and English. And I'm like, why are you asking me that question? It's obvious. They're completely different subjects. And I get why philosophy and psychology get wrapped into one another, but to me, they're completely different. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're, I know there's an overlap. I completely understand. I understand. But in my brain, in Brittany's brain, they're very different. So interesting. I have a video about this I want to make because I just, I'm fascinated with the fact that like this could even be a question. Rachel Thompson, which I will warn you is not for the faint of heart. It straight away goes into incredibly heavy stuff. I have been struggling whilst reading it. <laughs> now, one thing mm. which kept on coming up throughout the entire book was guys being like, but I'm a good guy, right? Like I'm not racist, right? You know, and wanting to get this justification from the women that they'd actually done really bad things to and just be like no but I'm good though right it makes me think of the guys that are quickly like not all men uh, you know when you actually bring up like people who have been victims of abuse or something as opposed to having like empathy for the people that have actually been through horrific stuff and instead they're centering themselves and being like I wouldn't do that not all of us like not my friends not no no the fear of the accusation is stronger than the sympathy for the victim no matter how many times okay. I want to give an example, okay? Because Kay says to me, the difference between philosophy and therapy is another person gives you the tools to learn how to build a house using a guide versus you using the tools to build the house yourself. Guys, psychologists help you if you have schizophrenia. How is philosophy going to help you with schizophrenia? You know what I'm saying? Like therapy, psychology is about your brain, like in your trauma. Philosophy is about your relationship to the universe yourself, so for me, like, I'm not talking about therapy. That's like, I don't know what kind of therapy you guys are like, are, is coming into people's brains when they ask me this question. But how could philosophy help you with your schizophrenia? Like, yes, it will help in the ways philosophy can, but it's not going to help you in the way that a doctor or somebody who studied this or is interested in helping schizophrenics can help you get to the next level, which is usually through medication and support. So in my brain, when people ask me, like, what is the difference between, you know, psychology and philosophy? It's like you're asking me what's the difference between a chiropractor and, uh, I don't know, a plastic surgeon. I'm like, what? They're different. Like, they're just different. Like, they're different. Like, psychology encompasses bipolar, schizophrenia, childhood trauma, abuse, like, literally so much that philosophy is supposed to help with other philosophies, other things. And so my brain is like, why are they, why are you relating them? Like, I know why people relate them. Again, I'm working on a video about this, you know, but to me, like psychology, therapy, all these things, they're about something so much more in my, in my head. Hey, this is philosophy can contextualize schizophrenia, but therapy actually helps. Kay says that sounds like the difference between psychiatry and philosophy. Psych psychology, psychiatry, all of it's the same to me. Say I put all of that in the same bubble. All of that is in the same bubble and then philosophy is in a different bubble.
So that's probably the problem too, is like when I think about it, I'm like, this is here and this is here, right? Cases psychiatry is more the dealing with human, the machine, while philosophy is dealing with human, the experience. I agree with that, but I think psychiatry and psychology and therapy are in those similar, they're much closer. There might be a bridge between talk therapy and like uh, different forms of therapy that are less like medical license therapy that might get us over to philosophy. I understand there's a bridge there. But yeah, every time I say like get therapy, I mean, go talk to someone about how your brain works and see if you need medication, see if you're hearing voices, see if you have childhood trauma, see if you have PTSD. When I say go to therapy, I'm saying go see if you're getting triggered medically and you're having problems functioning. When I say go to therapy, I'm saying go get your machine checked and then do philosophy at the same time, which is you, the human experience of you. So FYI, when I say go to therapy, I'm saying go get your machine checked. To emphasize the word, some men are like this. What I find disturbing here is that guys are still preoccupied with ensuring I say that instead of holding their friends accountable for the terrible things that they've done. Mm. Or that they may feel shame for something that they may have done in their past. And the thing is, right, I was thinking about this whilst I was on my walk. You know that study I brought up about guys viewing their dad as a male role model? Shame and humiliation are absolutely tactics which are used against boys to make sure that they're not too feminine, to make sure that they act the right way to make sure they don't step out of line to make sure that their emotions are shut off and the thing is it's not just their fathers that do that they teach it to the boys and then the boys teach it to each other and this is how patriarchy works because ding 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 or even outside the patriarchy this is just how like generational curses and tradition and bad behavior follows is you don't want to go stepping out of line and have your masculinity actually questioned right that is the hugest thing and so at least in my mind this feeling of shame is so heavily avoided by men because it brings up all of like these memories of like the times that they felt shamed in their life for not being manly enough and so it makes them feel not enough when that happens but that could just be me that could just be from my observations in life but that's just a theory my theory but like i bring up all the time all of us are capable of change positive mm. change comes in many different forms and the first step is to actually be like oh this makes you feel uncomfortable i should probably unpack why you know mm. being open to the idea of therapy or oh, i should unpack why and this stems from again this sounds like it could be philosophy but i think there's a distinct difference between philosophy encompassing all of the universe and yourself and therapy being about the brain, your relationship to trauma, your relationship to like how you process information, which is a little bit deeper and different, right? Like for, like therapy has names and terminologies. They've grouped people. They have names for things, you know, discourse at psychology, how philosophy, why I like that too, right? how your brain works and then why you do what you do. I think there's like a distinction there that's important, but I do believe in redemption. And I think you have to know the distinction between those two things in your own life to get to a point where you can be a different person, right? Because if you can't, then you're just gonna repeat the same patterns, which I kind of feel like it's hard to hold people accountable for repeating patterns outside of a, in a way that doesn't also make you a bad person. Like, cause I don't wanna torture people just because they're repeating bad patterns. I just want to properly react to their bad behavior. All of that good sort of stuff, you know, and even if it's just like asking someone, it's like, hey, is this OK? And also being willing to admit that we're wrong and being willing to realize that we don't know all of the things that we don't know. Right. Mm. That's the beauty of the fact that everyone's got so many different lived experiences. It's the beauty of the entire world. It's one of the reasons why I really like John and Hank Green and why I've always shouted them out, like since the start, when it comes to like good male role models, because you've got these two incredibly intelligent guys that are always like, no, but I don't know everything though. I'm still learning stuff. And they're in their forties, you know? So that's what mm -hmm. I mean. It's like, I think embracing that sort of mentality is a really good thing. And also just recognizing that everyone's human. Like everyone makes mistakes, everybody fumbles. The thing is, like I've been saying throughout this video, it comes down to having this consistent pattern of negative behavior done for manipulative purposes. Mm. That's where I'm like, 
oh, this is scary. Like if you fall into the first section of like being a brochure list and you didn't quite realize it and you're like, oh, there's probably some things I should learn there. That's great. There's always more that we can all learn. I mean, like I definitely know that I don't know everything and that's okay with me because there's so much to learn and there are so many amazing people to learn from, so many amazing books to read, everything. It's, it's a positive thing. So anyway, this has been a very heavy video. Thank you for making it through all the way to the Great video. The we really love to see it. I'm going to link her video. This was a great video. We love to see it. And it brought on some great conversation because this is, okay, this is the dilemma because um, you guys are saying philosophy is also the science of logic and psychology figures out the directions of one thoughts. The problem is, is there's this, first of all, you want to, there's a subjectivity to a lot of this. Hayda says philosophy isn't just about people. Philosophy is about logic and methods of rationality. I think it's more of a construct in a sense where I think that means different things to different people. So sometimes I'll meet people who are like, I'm doing philosophy because I've come to a rational and logical conclusion that this is the only answer. Philosophy. That's an interesting way to experience philosophy to me. That's an, ex that's an interesting way to examine the universe to me. It feels very short-sighted. And I think sometimes people think philosophy means that the answer is the bubble construct they've decided is the answer. And then it runs into being bad logic. That sounds like good logic, but because it's philosophy, it's still logic, I guess. Right. So then I, I get into this like conundrum where I'm not convinced that we even know what any of these words mean enough to even have the right conversation in the right group. So then we have to have like that conversation about like, what do you mean by this? And what do you mean by this? And what do you, which always goes down back to bubbles. So then it goes down to English and words being used differently, right? I understand why people feel like Brittany's not doing philosophy because when I do philosophy, it looks like this. I get it. In the same way that I'm like, oh, that's not really a Catholic because if you're Catholic, you should do this. What we're saying is, mm, by the way that I understand the rules, you're not following the rules, but the rules are a construct. So when I look at a Catholic and I think, oh, you're not being very Catholic, I'm going based off the Vatican. I'm like, oh, well, based off Roman, like by the Pope, you're not being very Catholic. And they're like, oh, well, I'm going to do it this way. I'm like, okay. So there's something to that too, because it's all a construct in the same. Even the Pope is a construct. So when we're having these conversations, you really got to distinguish like what kind of a conversation are we having? Are we exploring and being excited and going, what do you think about this? And what do you think about this? And what do you think about this? Are we doing the, actually, um, this is the answer because blah, 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 blah. Anyways, with that said, just remember that I think all the answers have already been solved or all the answers are already in the universe. All the questions have been solved. It's just a matter of finding them. So at this point, we're all just like on a treasure hunt for the answers. But I think they're already there. We just have to discover them. I think some people think we have to make up the answers. I think the answers are already there. We're just discovering them. So this idea that like we don't know yet. Well, somebody does. Something does. It really exists. It's just a matter of it being discovered. And discovering things is a lot harder because it's a process. And it may take a long time to discover. Discovering truth is like being in a mall in 1995 and Jurassic Park just came out and you're like digging up the fake dinosaur bones at the, at the little booth. Did you guys do that as kids? And I remember doing it and thinking, oh, this is so cool. I'm like digging up a dinosaur bone. You have to go slow and methodical and thoughtful. And then eventually... You dig up a bone, you've been working on it for days, and then you realize, holy shit, it's just the pinky. Fuck, now I have to dig up the rest of the dinosaur to see what kind of dinosaur it is. You're always just digging up a part of the, the answer, but it definitely, I think, is there, right? Kay says, yes, the truth just is, always has been, always will. It just is. You can't, I'm not gonna argue with what's true. It just is. That's when people think like, Oh, Brittany thinks she like discovered philosophy or discovered something or made up the levels. I mean, you, you can't make up math. You can't make up the truth. You can just discover it and recontextualize it for other people. Like I don't get to decide what's true. And that puts a lot of pressure off of you in a lot of ways. But see, people want to think they discovered something. People want to think they invented something. Give me credit. I'm Christopher Columbus. I discovered America, even though people were already living here. How funny men are to take credit for something that they didn't even earn. So they accuse you of doing the same thing. I'm not trying to take credit for nothing. I'm no Christopher Columbus, but let me tell you something. It's clear how desperate these men want to be him. Since I've been nothing but blessed
So what's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool. Dun, 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 dun.